1952, the world needed an elite counterinsurgency and intelligence group. This special force is known around the world as the Green Berets. The military knows them as the U.S. Army Special Forces. While these men are trained to infiltrate deep behind enemy lines and to conduct guerrilla warfare, their principal mission has always been to train indigenous forces to fight for their own freedom. Special Forces is an elite force. They're teachers before they're killers. We're here to, to help people that cannot help themselves. The U.S. Army Special Forces was relatively unknown until 1963, when a civilian named Robin Moore wrote a book titled The Green Berets. It was this bestseller that introduced the elite military group to the world. The title of this book became their nickname, and it stuck. The brave men of the Green Berets. I think Robin Moore is an incredible individual did wonders for the Special Forces image. Special Forces tends to be the quiet professional. We don't like to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, we don't like the ballyhoo, the photos. Uh, so as a result, it was nice to have someone like Robin Moore bring us into the limelight. I'd always wanted to do something with the Green Berets. I'd always, I, I mean, I knew they were in existence. And in 1962, I met one or two of them, and I, I decided that would be my next book. I went to General Yarbrough and he said, everybody wants to write a book about us, right? I'm not going to have anybody, any civilian coming down writing a book. Unless you were us, you can't write it. I said, well, how about letting me go through the course? He said, all right. So he sent me to jump school. I passed that. Right now you can go through the, get through my course, the Q course, and maybe we can send you to Vietnam. A song quickly followed. And who better to put the Special Forces story to music than an SF medic, Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler. Written as he recuperated from a wound during his service in Vietnam, the song was originally a poem. The poem was later put to music and became an international hit. Fighting soldiers from the sky Fearless men who jump and die Men who mean just what they say the brave men of the Green Beret. Any ceremony that you go to and you see, for an example, retired or former pair, uh, SF soldiers, and the Ballad of the Green Beret plays, you'll see them stand their attention. Sometimes even in wheelchairs. They stand at attention. Silver wings upon their chest. These are men, America's best. One hundred men will test today, but only three when the Green Beret. Now the only thing left to do was to put the story of the Green Berets on the big screen. And the only star big enough to get the job done right was none other than the Duke himself, John Wayne. 1968, back of a uh, station wagon with my parents up front, and a drive-in movie, John Wayne, The Green Berets. The story of courage, compassion, of dedicated professionalism of our American men in every part of the world. The story of heat and cold and rain and dirt. The long hours that alternate between near boredom and sheer terror. I was there all the time on the, on the set with, with, with Wayne. I rewrote the script every night for him. Quite interesting. The movie was not much like the way it was written originally, but it was much better because we got a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement into it. Every night the script would be a little different the next day than the people who read it. So it came out pretty well. He was very careful in how he depicted uh, the life of special forces and how they actually operated in Vietnam. So they, they special forces adopted him as, as like the, uh, I guess, the movie star father of, uh, of special forces. The nickname Green Beret has stuck with the men of special forces. To this day, the soldiers correct this well-known but informal term. 
it was a term that came out in the 60s. They were the Green Berets, the song, the Green Berets, the movie, the Green Berets. That's a headgear, that's all. Very uncomfortable headgear, matter of fact. Today's philosophy is that the Green Beret is a hat. We are Special Forces soldiers, the quiet professionals. We got a tab that says Special Forces on it. And, um, and we got a hat that's, that's a Green Beret. I was a college student in Wilson, North Carolina, 1965, and the Klan decided to hold a march. And we were down there jeering them. Right in front of the courthouse, they're supposed to go all the way to the railroad station. Two blocks short of the, short of the railroad station was this very tall black man. Khakis, gleaming boots, a green beret perched on his head. And he's just standing there, just like this. And when they reached him, they turned left, three blocks short of where they're supposed to. I thought to myself, now that is something. So I went back and got the book and read it and said, these are my kind of folks. has to be damn dedicated, determined, and he's got to be dependent. And he's got to have it in his heart that that's where he wants to be. He has to make a lot of sacrifices to be there. I guess you might say in certain, uh, uh, certain instances, they're uh, a little bit out of their mind. The motto of Special Forces is Deo Presso Liber, which means to free from oppression. We take it really seriously. With freedom, all things are possible. You know, when you're oppressed, you're so limited. So, yeah, I think our legacy is, is freedom. Back in the old days, the guys that joined Special Forces were a hard-charging, hard-fighting, hard-drinking group of fellas uh, that didn't normally fit into other units because they didn't fit the mold that the U.S. Army had for soldiers. Through the years, due in part to the nature of many Special Forces operations, the Green Beret has become a symbol of mystery, a warrior who operates at the furthest edge of our U.S. forces. The United States has much on the line when sending the men of special forces overseas. Their missions are of the highest order. Their training has always been the best the U.S. military has to offer. This tradition of excellence was set in motion by the blood and sweat of the SF forefathers, men who can only be described as legends. You're joining an organization that has a lot of proud heritage and um, people who've done a lot of great things. So. You want to be a part of that and uh, live up to their standards, the standards of the, that have been set before you. I think we owe a certain level of integrity to them, not just for the beret, but for what they did to establish the standards they set up and the operations that they went on, that we still have to make it mission successful. Because when we ever, <laughs> we'll have to answer to them someday, and I wouldn't want to do that, not with my old teammates. The Special Forces lineage is as distinguished as its legacy. It's, it's a heritage of unconventional warfare. Special operations started when man started fighting wars. With the globe on the brink of world war and the attack on Pearl Harbor only a few short months away, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the Office of Coordinator of Information on July 11, 1941. Colonel Wild Bill Donovan was put in charge of this new office. Donovan himself was a unique man, a man who by the end of his life had many distinguishing careers, lawyer, soldier, diplomat, and hero. By the end of his service, Wild Bill Donovan would be the only American to have received the four highest awards of the United States, the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross, the Distinguished Service Medal, and the National Security Medal. On June 13, 1942, the COI was redesigned as the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, and Donovan would once again be named chief. Intelligence gathering, resistance movements, and sabotage, the OSS was changing the way America fought, and war would never be the same.
diplomat, warrior, soldier, patriot. In a world of hype and sensationalism, the men of the Green Berets are the reality, not the myth. As far as the U.S. Army Special Forces, uh, really we de developed out of the OSS. We grew out of that, uh, specifically out of the need to have an unconventional warfare capability in Europe in case the Russians invaded uh, during the 50s. And we developed from there. The OSS was already out in the field, gathering information for the war effort in places like India, China, and Burma. As the war raged on, the OSS became a vital part of America's war machine. Teams were secretly deployed in all corners of the globe, in every region of conflict. This new OSS was rapidly becoming as much about combat as it was about information. By then, Jedberg was already a well-used term for this organization, referring to personnel who were dropped behind enemy lines. The Jedberg uh, teams were teams of three men. Uh, it was an allied uh, organization. The idea was that uh, we would be parachuted into occupied uh, France, uh, into an area that had been reported to have a resistance or guerrilla potential. Uh, with that uh, leadership, we then started building uh, a good maquis, as they were called, uh, a resistance force. We were able to train them because we had that kind of training. We were able to arm them by calling in for uh, air supplies uh, and, uh, and then eventually had authority to lead them in operations against the German garrisons. It was during this time that new means of battle were invented, many thanks to the efforts of the OSS. Psychological warfare was being developed. Secret forces from the OSS worked closely with covert operators from other countries. The British taught the Americans and the Americans taught the British. Operational group branches were established, giving firepower to the spies. In short, it was a time of growth and change for the way America fought. And by the time the war was over, many in Washington and the military knew that this was only the beginning of special operations. VJ Day, September 2nd, 1945. Japan formally surrenders aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. World War II is officially over. It's also the end of the OSS. 18 days later on September 20th, President Truman signs Executive Order 9621, disbanding the OSS. But this was a sign of greater things to come. The end of the war signaled a need for a new and greater office of secret operations. It was already on the drawing board, and it came out of hiding a few months later, on January 22nd, 1946. The Central Intelligence Agency was created. For the next four years, the CIA worked with the United States military whenever a union of covert observation and firepower would be needed for the sake of national security. The world was on edge during this time, peaking on June 25, 1950, the day North Korea crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea. This action sparked full-fledged involvement by the United States in the Korean War. Guerrilla operations were established in many areas during the conflict. As the U.S. military discovered during World War II, there became an increasing need for more and more covert operations, Operations manned by men who specialized in knowing how to work and survive behind enemy lines. More importantly, there was a need to create a system where the United States could help countries help themselves. Korea was the perfect example of the need for what would become modern day special forces. The U.S. was learning that it could not police the world or fight every battle for the oppressed. But if it could share its knowledge and expertise with those who were willing to fight for themselves, this could be the answer. 
the U.S. Army Special Forces began with the activation of the 10th Special Forces Group Airborne on Smoke Bomb Hill at Fort Bragg, North Carolina on June 19, 1952. Spearheading this operation was a soldier plucked from the heart of the OSS. The Army needed an operator with a wealth of knowledge about guerrilla warfare. Colonel Aaron Bank fit the assignment perfectly. He was the, the father of special forces. He's the one that kind of started the, the whole ball rolling. He's a man of immense integrity. Um, he's one of a kind. His, his history in the military reads like a Hollywood script. He set the initial mold for special forces. Bank knew all too well that the face of war was changing, and the U.S. Army had to change with it. Aaron Banks in 19, 1951 convinced the Army that, that, as a visionary, that the kind of wars we're going to see, they'd already seen the Malaysian War uh, with the British against the Communists there, they'd already seen the, the, the grass wars in uh, Africa. He convinced them there had to be somebody trained to go into that environment. Aaron Bank knew this because he had been operating behind enemy lines as one of the original Jedburgh team members. He was thrust into a world of sabotage, intelligence gathering, and liberation movements. I myself uh, was dropped in uh, to gain intelligence. And I was dropped in as a German junior officer. As a member of the OSS, Bank worked with foreign soldiers and trained underground resistance forces. This foundation gave him the experience needed to create the Green Berets of today. It, it wasn't an easy job. We didn't have, at first, the type of an organization, intelligence-wise, that was necessary for World War II. It just happened that I happened to strike the proper chord and was able to develop myself for that type of activity and as well as help train others. He was a great leader. Aaron Banks was a great leader, a very, very intelligent man and very, very brave. Bravery was a prerequisite for the job Bank had only the most vital missions came his way. The main mission I had was to capture Hitler. Operation Iron Cross, the mission to capture Hitler, would be only one of many highly sensitive operations in Bank's career. I think his most unbelievable uh, accreditation, which people don't realize, he spent three weeks with Ho Chi Minh uh, in Southeast Asia, traveling across Southeast Asia in a car, uh, and then reported back to the U.S. State Department that if we didn't back this individual, that we would end up fighting this individual. And his, his report was just filed away in the, some file cabinet somewhere, and sure enough, as, <clears throat> as it would be had, uh, that was in the 40s, like 43 or 44. Come uh, the 60s, we end up fighting Ho Chi Minh, just like uh, Aaron Bank had predicted. He was the nexus between OSS and what later became the Green Berets. Uh, we took the very best of what OSS represented, and yet we had to go into a different uh, dimension to produce Green Berets. And the timing could not have been more perfect. A communist threat was emerging in a country in Southeast Asia that would change American history forever. Vietnam. In the late 50s, we, uh, we had uh, soldiers going to uh, Vietnam or to, into Laos and doing operations during that period of time already. Years before the Vietnam War, SF units were sent in to build the resistance force of South Vietnam. The South Vietnamese would need all the help they could get. The NVA was a highly motivated, combat-hardened enemy. Preparing the South for the relentless attacks by the North would be the ultimate test for the newly formed Special Forces. In V 
Vietnam, it was more than just the actual Green Beret that distinguished special forces from the conventional American units. Building a bond with foreign soldiers takes patience and bravery. In many ways, there's no job on Earth more challenging or hazardous. But the SF soldier has a great role where he can be called upon and become the ultimate force multiplier at a moment's notice. The idea of a force multiplier is that um, if you send a small cadre which can lead uh, or advise uh, a, an indigenous group, a, a group that's native to the area that you're operating in, then for 12 guys you can have uh, a battalion of guys out there in the woods or sometimes even a regiment. Um, and, you only, and you only have to deploy 12 Americans to do that. So obviously if you can get 450 people on the ground and only send 12 guys, uh, you've done a good thing. Acting as force multipliers would be the primary mission for the Green Berets. Economical use of force. You can send 12 guys where you'd have to send a, uh, a battalion of a regular unit to go and do the things that 12 guys are capable of doing. Uh, so, and plus the fact, you know, you can put them on an airplane and one airplane and send them somewhere and nobody would ever miss them. Nobody cares whether an SF team is gone or not. Uh, and that makes the difference. Special forces now had a mission and they had a name. And of course they had a symbol, the Green Beret, but not officially. The Beret was not authorized in Fort Bragg. It was not authorized in the field or in garrison or with Class A uniform. We kind of borrowed that from the, uh, from the British commandos. They wore Green Berets. And we thought their hats were cool. So uh, when Colonel Bank organized the unit, these guys started wearing uh, wearing their berets on, on operations or on training missions in the jungle um, or in the mountains. Um, and then um, after a while it became, you know, sort of an unofficial trademark. Uh, it was forbidden by the Pentagon. They said it looked too foreign. It wasn't until the president, it took the president of the United States that changed that. That president was John F. Kennedy. JFK had championed special operations from the very beginning of his administration. President Kennedy was a big booster of special forces. So when he went to Fort Bragg to inspect this, General Yarborough, who was the commanding general there at that time, uh, coordinated this with the president's aide, uh, Chief, uh, General Clifton, who had been a classmate of his at West Point, uh, to put everybody out there in their beanies. Clifton and I agreed that uh, when the president came down to Fort Bragg to look at a division, prim uh, ostensibly, to look at a division all lined up on the, uh, on the, on the uh, parade field, he would actually also go out and have a look at special forces. And that uh, special forces at that point, if they came out in the Green Beret, there was, it wasn't very much that the uh, regular army system could do to, to stop it. So, he uh, and I agreed that when the president arrived, our troops would have the Green Beret. So these guys uh, scrounged up all the berets they could find, and when they went out to greet the president, they were wearing Green Berets, and, and he was impressed with what he saw. Proudest moment of my life. I was at uh, Bragg when uh, President Kennedy came down, and uh, General Yarborough uh, escorted him out to uh, the lake where they gave a demonstration in the Colors Lodge Lake. And uh, of course Yarborough had his beret on and we were standing all line. We were guards along the, the highway about six or eight feet all the way out to McKellar's Lodge. And there goes Yarborough with his beret on his two stars and President Kennedy company President Kennedy. It was to mark the emergence in the regular system of something that had not been there before, which was the Special Forces soldier. There'd never been a, um, uh, uh, in anybody's army anywhere in the world, a group of men that were more highly selected for all of the reasons that we understand than the Green Berets. And so the beret was that symbol. After the uh, presidential visit, the demonstration, uh, got the word down that the president had, was going to give the okay or the authorization to the Green Berets or the special forces at that time to be authorized to wear the Green Beret. 
In a letter dated April 11, 1962, JFK showed his unwavering support for special forces, officially authorizing the beret, calling this new elite military icon a symbol of excellence, a badge of courage, a mark of distinction in the fight for freedom. From then on, um, it became an official part of the uniform, and almost nobody ever wore it in the field again because it's a terrible field hat. It's hot in the summertime and uh, doesn't keep the sun out of your eyes and so forth. There are other symbols that represent the heart and soul of Special Forces. The Special Forces insignia consist of a, of a commando dagger, two crossed arrows from the Indian Scouts, and a Dio Presso Liber banner. The, the insignia, Dio Presso Liber, means to free the oppressed. It's the Special Forces motto and the purpose of Special Forces. I, I think helping people on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, uh, goes a long way in this world. And uh, that's, to me, what Special Forces does. This uh, shoulder patch that uh, the Special Forces soldier wears, uh, the arrowhead represents the uh, Native American Indians and their stealthiness in the way they uh, uh, went to combat and the way they're the kind of warrior-like uh, uh, mentality, their attitudes. The uh, sword that uh, stands uh, upright in the middle just represents it's a weapon uh, to, to go to combat with. And then you have uh, three lightning bolts that uh, cross the, uh, the sword, which stands for land, sea, or air. And those are means by which uh, Special Forces troops can infiltrate. These skills would be tested time and again during the Vietnam War, a war that would also test our entire nation. The Special Forces A-teams proved in Vietnam that they were the ultimate force multiplier. The North Vietnamese Army was quickly moving on South Vietnam. Forces in South Vietnam were underdeveloped, and other non-military groups were willing, but not necessarily able to protect themselves against the North Vietnamese insurgency. Well, I thought the enemy was very well prepared, very well equipped, ingenious little bastards. The great foxholes, well, they were really good soldiers, very disciplined. The VC and the NVA, people who underestimated them are probably dead today. They were the most resourceful, motivated enemy that I've ever known. I mean, uh, they, they, they fought hard, they lived through hard times, uh, and, and they were just, they were not to be underestimated. They, they were very capable foe. They weren't ragtags. They were hard charges. My men were good, and so were the enemy. Mine were just a little bit better. The United States had been quietly building a military presence in Vietnam for years. Over the years, it expanded, and, uh, and then, of course, it escalated where these uh, four main force units start rolling there in 65. Special Forces had always been there. The U.S. had been sending in these small, undetectable units deep into the heart of Vietnam to train the indigenous forces. We were everywhere. Yeah, really. <laughs> we were in places that uh, no man had even want to go. And build an A camp out in the middle of nowhere. SFA teams would mobilize hundreds into huge A camps, consisting of a combination of units. The SF formula was working. My A camp, at first there was 12 of us in the A camp, 12 American Special Forces, A and SF Special Forces team. Uh, I had, a, uh, I had a two Vietnamese companies, I had two Cambodian companies, and I had a mountain yard company, which ran about five, six hundred people, over over five hundred. Plus, I had a recon platoon as well in 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 the in the camp. So uh, so an SF team had an operational unit anywhere from five to seven hundred people in an A camp uh, that were uh, were operational that were combat combat ready soldiers. We trained them up. We we taught them tactics. Uh, we taught them. We gave them uh, you know weapons. We gave them uniforms, uh, we gave them uh, rations, uh, we fed them, we took care of them. 
A mark of the SF soldier is his commitment to helping others. Even though there was some resistance to the war in America, the SF soldier was passionate about his mission in South Vietnam. He wanted to be there. That's what we train for, is to go and help people. Just like what's on our crest, the oppressed labor, free the oppressed. And I love a challenge like that. I love working with people. I like to work with people who's what considered the underdog. Colonel O. Lee Mize is just such a soldier. For his bravery in the Korean War, Mize received the Medal of Honor, an honor which made it difficult for him to be allowed to go to Vietnam. They took a damn view of me going over and getting killed or something. But that's where I belong, in Southeast Asia. Despite the incredible benefits, acting as force multipliers still had its drawbacks. Operating in isolated areas of Vietnam, special forces teams and their A camps were vulnerable to attack. In order to protect their own, the teacher would have to become a warrior. The South Vietnamese Army needed help. The guerrilla tactics of the NVA were taking their toll on a weakened South Vietnam. Special forces went to work closely with these military groups. Among the specialty groups of special forces in Vietnam were the hatchet teams and the Mike force. These rescue teams consisted of five special forces team members and about 30 indigenous personnel, including Cambodians, Nungs, and Montagnards. The hatchet teams would be used for rescue operations, ambushes, or as reinforcements, anything to support the main recon team. Recon teams find and fix the enemy. The hatchet teams go and destroy the enemy. I had the second exploitation company, which was a Cambodian hatchet team. And uh, uh, some people call them roadrunner teams, hatchet teams. Uh, it was actually the exploitation and what the, the purpose of it was, was the recon teams would find the targets, and then hopefully the exploitation teams would come in and exploit the targets. And uh, so we were called hatchet forces, hatchet teams. We had a lot of various names. Performing a similar type of operation within South Vietnam was the Mike Force. Led by the Green Berets, the Mobile Strike Force was a countrywide roving SWAT team stocked with Vietnam's ethnic tribesmen, including the Montagnards. The Mike forces uh, were formed basically to help uh, react to any one of the base camps that was formed to come under uh, threat by communists, uh, either by North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong, because military, the active duty army uh, didn't want to take casualties trying to go after a CIDG camp. So the Mike forces uh, was something that was developed to take care of our own. The special forces had um, I think we had around 100 camps scattered throughout, throughout Vietnam um, and in four different core areas. Well, those, those, those camps came under attack a lot of the time and uh, there was no, you know, there was no cavalry to send for when, when, when those little forts were besieged by Indians. Uh, so basically the Mike force were formed as the cavalry to go to these guys' rescue. Constantly on call, it was the duty of the Mike Force to rescue or reinforce platoons or camps that were under attack, under the threat of attack, or already overrun. Well, there's five different Mike Forces, and each corps had a Mike Force, and uh, then there's one, the Fifth Space Force group called P-55, and, uh, and they all serve in many, many capacities, and some of the, some of the major fights that we had with camps, uh, the Mike Forces were involved with. Our reputation was, you know, have gun, we'll travel. You got in trouble, call us, we'll come get you out. We did it day after day. Of the indigenous groups in Vietnam, the Montagnards and Green Berets formed a unique bond. The Montagnards were, were exemplary in the Mike Force. We, of course, we had the best trained troops in Vietnam, we felt, and they were the best equipped. We had all M16s, M60s, mortars. We had everything an American unit could have, and the Montagnards used them very, very well. We found them to be uh, loyal, 
um, hardworking, friendly, and, uh, and dedicated. So we got to where we loved them a lot. With weapons and skills, they were finally given a chance to fight for their freedom and became trusted companions to the Green Berets. They had from just incredible loyalty to the Americans, and the Americans um, uh, did some incredible things to show their loyalty. They would risk their lives, the Americans would frequently, to save one of the mountain yards. And so this developed a loyalty. The mountain yards were an oppressed group that lived in the highlands of South Vietnam. Both the North and South Vietnamese saw them as savages. The mountain yards are uh, tribal people, um, mostly in South Vietnam, but that, that's the name for the, the tribal people in uh, South Vietnam. They're tribal people throughout Southeast Asia of essentially the same type. Um, they weren't Vietnamese. They were of uh, either Malayo-Polynesian or Mon Khmer ethnic derivation. There were like 31 tribes of them, and each one of them had their own language. Uh, and we worked with quite a few of those tribes. Good people, uh, dedicated people, uh, wanted to be left alone, wanted to protect their own families, and, uh, and we wanted to work with them so that that could happen. There was no love between the mountain yards and the Vietnamese. The mountain yards uh, were basically uh, hill people. Uh, in com in, to compare them with something that uh, took place in the United States would probably be that they were uh, like our Native Americans, the Indians, uh, versus the people uh, that, that took the land from the Indians. Uh, the Vietnamese would allow them to stay in the highlands uh, they had no say-so in the government. They held no government positions. Uh, they were not in the Vietnamese army. Uh, you just stay up there in the mountains. And these people were in loincloths armed with crossbows. What they did have was a determination. And this was exactly the kind of student that the Green Berets were looking for. I, I trained them, I equipped them, uh, made sure they were paid, made sure that they had enough of food and because they lived in the camp with us. Uh, they were not only in, in the internal perimeter, but uh, their families were also located in the camp with us. We did that for the reason if a person would fight real hard to defend his family. So that's why we allowed them to have their families inside the camp with us, which in the long run proved to be a, a, a smart decision. Commanding an A camp was an enormous responsibility. Being the world's finest teachers, the SF soldiers know when to take advice. I trusted all the indigenous forces I worked with with my life numerous occasions. It was just like two Americans and 160 mountain yards or Chinese out in the field together. If you didn't trust them, why go out to the field? Your life was in their hands. You depended upon them. They lived in the jungles their entire lives and had avoided the booby traps and the pitfalls of Vietnam their entire lives growing up. They'd all lost brothers and sisters to the booby traps around their villages and stuff. And as we'd walk through the jungle, they'd point over there, don't step there, Boxy, don't step there. Or watch out for that booby trap. They lived together with their, uh, their tribesmen and learned their customs, and uh, they knew that that was a team. And it was one of the things that other commanders in uh, Vietnam would remark to me. He said, I just don't know how you were able to develop that kind of loyalty and that kind of expertise in those people who are so primitive in their, in their background, in their culture. Special Forces units thrived in Vietnam. Even so, the war was slipping away from the United States. The conventional military forces were having trouble keeping up with an unconventional enemy. By the mid-1970s, there were almost 500 known POWs and another thousand missing. Reports from the POW camps were dismal, torture, brutality, and death. In some cases, POWs had been held for over 2,000 days. These were the worst conditions possible, and something had to be done. So a secret mission was planned. A group of soldiers began training for what would become one of the most perfectly planned and perfectly executed rescue missions in military history, the Sante Raid.
Sante Rada was important to me to rescue American POWs. It was Americans in trouble. They were being mistreated. And if I could go in and help them get them out, I'd do it. 23 miles from Hanoi, the Son Tê prison camp was in one of the most highly secure areas of North Vietnam. Protected by close to 250,000 troops and the most concentrated surface-to-air missile defense in the history of war, the target was, to say the least, hot. The rescue team trained for months. Uh, we started uh, in uh, late August, right up to the day before the raid started. We trained right up to that point. Sometimes 16, 17, sometimes 20 hours a day. The United States had their pick of military forces to carry out this precise plan. Marine Force Recon, Army Rangers, and Navy SEALs all held the necessary talents to carry out the mission. But for the commander assigned to head up the raid, there was only one choice. He wouldn't have had anybody else, Bill Simons. He's an icon. He's a, he's a legend. He's, he's held up uh, you know, as the epitome of what a special operations warrior is. And in fact, his name is on the, uh, the award that we present annually uh, you know, to the icons of our business. This last year, we presented the Bull Simons Award to uh, Lieutenant General Retired uh, Bill Yarborough. I took him to Korea as my chief of staff because Bull Simons was the kind of guy that all he had to do was look at you and you'd say, yes, sir. He didn't have to raise his voice. He had a look of command, and he had the art of command, the epitome of what the Special Forces soldier ought to be, I think, the Bull. Bull Simons wasn't the only legend on the Sante raid. Commanding the B team was Major Richard Meadows. He joined the Army at the tender age of 15, and his distinguished career included tours in Korea and Vietnam. Dick was clearly the bravest man that I've ever known. And also one that intellectually was uh, uh, w w was very broad. His simplicity, his uh, absolute uh, uh, perfect instincts to situations have always been a, uh, a, source, of, a source of strength. But he was a humble man, and he didn't exploit what he did. He didn't brag about what he did. Dick Meadows was the epitome of the quiet professional, as we call special operations guys right now. He, uh, he was more concerned about the mission and his men than he ever was of himself. On November 20th, 1970, Colonel Bull Simons, Dick Meadows, and 55 SF soldiers boarded two CH-3 helicopters. Their mission was clear, penetrate deep into NVA territory to rescue an estimated 75 American POWs from the Sante compound. The plan was executed brilliantly. The SF team was in the den of the enemy, but they had the element of surprise on their side. The Green Berets attacked the Sante guards with surgical precision. Not one SF soldier was lost on the mission. The only problem was there were no prisoners. They had been moved just days prior to the raid. They was only two kilometers, part of them, from where we hit at. They had moved them. They heard the firefight going on. They knew there was something going on. They heard the bombing, and they knew there was something going on. What can you do? Yeah. They weren't there, they weren't there. But uh, we did our job. If they'd have been there, we'd have got them out. There was no problem about that. Even though the Sante Raiders didn't rescue prisoners that night, the mission did save lives. Our mission gave them continuous hope. Uh, once they were released and they were talking as, at our reunion, uh, the two most significant things that uh, saved their lives was uh, Operation Linebacker and the Sante Raid. They brought them all together in Hanoi. Instead of one man to a cell, two men to a cell, it turned into be 50 men to a cell to where they could take care of each other and they had power in numbers. And you can ask all the POWs that I've talked to. They said, you didn't get us out, but there's one thing you done. You brought us together because Hanoi really got scared after we carried this raid out and got in there because they knew that we could come and get them. I'm very proud. It accomplished just about what we went. We didn't bring no warm bodies back, 
but we helped the POWs. We got better treatment for them, and uh, I'm very proud to have done that. We sometimes hear that the young in America have no heroes. This is the answer. When a man is willing to risk his life to rescue one of his fellow men, that is heroism of the highest order. The Son Tay Raid marked the beginning of the end of the Vietnam conflict. American forces began to evacuate the struggling Asian country. But for the Green Berets, there was still one thing to be done. A promise was made to a group of outcasts that lived in the hills. As the U.S. withdrew from Vietnam, Special Forces was in a dilemma between following orders and honoring their word to the Montagnards. Tribe people told if they fought with us, they'd be paid. That's the first thing. If something happened to you, we would take care of your family. And we would take care of you if something happened to you. Hey, wounded, you know, something bad. Well, we just got up and left. The call for help from the Special Forces soldiers fell on deaf ears. They knew that if something wasn't done to protect the yards, tragedy was sure to follow. We left. That was it, see. Then, they, days later, they started killing all the mouth of the yards in that area. They just slaughtered. They saved a lot of our lives. They were good fighters. We tell them to do something, they would do it. They were brave little son of a gun. So we left them there, and they ended up in the concentration camps. If they didn't end up in the concentration camps, they were, ended up in the villages where the, the North Vietnamese started a very sophisticated cultural genocide. The mountain yard, the woman must marry a Vietnamese man. That's cultural genocide. And uh, I and my, uh, some of my mouth and yard friends estimate, I shouldn't say estimate, we know, you know, that uh, the first part of, uh, of uh, I guess from 75 to 82, there's a couple of hundred thousand that were killed off. I had some good civilian pilot fly me over to Fuquak Island I found there was a hundred mountain yard children over there. So I convinced him to fly that plane over to Fuquak Island. And I loaded all those little orphans on the mountain yard orphans onto that aircraft and flew them back to Saigon and handed them over to the minister. Then I found out later they uh, uh, shipped them all to uh, Norway. A promise was made and decades later, it is still being kept. To me, they hold a very, a very dear place in my heart. I, and I'm still in, in contact with a few of them in the United States now. And I'm working part time in a project. It's called Save the Mountain Yards. And we're, we're trying to bring more of the mountain yards into the United States. We promised the brew that would help them when we were recruited them, yeah, strikers and everything else. And then we left them sort of high and dry. So now I go back in there to say, hey, we're still here for you. Always shying away from glory, the SF soldier performs at his best because he is expected to. You, you did things on a day-to-day -day basis that probably would have gotten you a silver star minimum silver star in any line unit in Vietnam. But that was just what you did. That, that's what was expected of you, and you just did it. Uh, nobody was out after medals. Nobody wanted medals. Uh, I put a guy in for a silver star one time on a special operation that we were running up, up out of CCN after CCN got overrun, and uh, we ran some specials for them. And uh, this guy was a, uh, just did an outstanding job, and I put him in for a, uh, for a silver star, and, and I uh, threatened to whip my ass. He said he wasn't about medals and he wasn't out here to get medals. Special Forces members were among the most highly decorated of all of the United States Armed Services. 
the awards did not come without great sacrifice. Because the SF units operated deep in enemy territory, they lived with the day-to-day -day threat of attack, and the men in the Green Beret were at the top of the enemy's list. Probably the hairiest was, uh, I mean, we were nitty-gritty. Uh, it actually got down to hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. I didn't think we were going to make it through the night, really didn't. Uh, we were totally overwhelmed, and we did manage to make it through. And don't ask me how, but I think uh, that's where you reach down and intestinal fortitude comes out, whether you know it or not, and you, you drive on. If you don't drive on, it's over with. and you. You don't think of yourself, you think of your other friends, that if you stop, they could die. So you keep going yourself. And, you know, it, it, it worked. We made it through the night, uh, you know. Uh, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> Some of us made it through the night. Uh, when we lost one of our our brothers out there in combat, we would all, those of us that were back in base camp would congregate in the club and uh, we'd tell stories about them and drink beer and reminisce about all the good times. Socrates said that a man is will live as long as he's remembered. I remember them alive. I see their pictures in my mind. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial, or the Wall, serves as a unique testament to the sacrifice and selflessness of the American men and women who served in Vietnam. The war has always been a controversial topic for the country, but the memorial was established to begin the process of healing. Created out of polished black granite, the wall contains the names of all 58,191 who died or remain missing in Vietnam. The names themselves each representing an act of individual sacrifice, have become the memorial. You, uh, you get the whole sense of, of what the Vietnam War cost this country when you see that wall and the, and the names on that wall that go on for a long, long way. I think everybody I looked up was on the wall. It represents this, this rank deep ranks of, of, of troops that are standing behind us as we face the future. As, as our fallen join, as their names are entered on the wall, it's like another member joining the ranks there that, that tends to strengthen your resolve as you move forward. It gives you the courage to, to execute the visions that you have. And, uh, you know, without, without that strength, some of these visions would be very, very difficult. To, some of these hills would be tough to climb. They're all good men. Like I say, side major Pegram, side major, he's on the wall. Guavo. Yep. Freedom is bought with the blood of patriots. We always have to bear in mind that the freedoms that we have, that we keep, were paid for by someone making sacrifice. One of the most influential champions of the Green Beret cause was entertainer Martha Ray. When she was not entertaining the masses in Vietnam, she was spending a good deal of her time with the SF. For nine years, she went to support the units in Vietnam, staying as long as six months. The SF simply called her Maggie. Uh, she was one of us. Uh, the woman would do anything. Uh, you can hear stories about her forever and ever. Not only was she an outstanding entertainer, she was a skilled nurse, and when things got rough, she filled in, often going hours without a break. She took Special Forces as her pet project, I guess you might say, and she never looked back. She, she took us for what we were. Uh, we didn't have to put on pretenses. We didn't have to pretend to, to, to do anything. We could just be ourselves around her, and she accepted us for that. She flew into camps in Vietnam, eight attachment camps, out on the border. No one else would have gone out there. But she relished the thought of going out there. 
the excitement to her was, I think, her lifeline during that period of time. And she just adopted Special Forces. Uh, she, she, she visited my camp a couple of times, tossed down a few with us. She came there alone, not with any entourage, you know. She, you know she's really good. She's just a truly great lady. She did a lot for our association, uh, which in turn did a lot for uh, individuals in the association through grants and scholarships and things that she made available. And uh, it's a great loss when we lost her. When she died, a special exception to policy was made so that she could be buried in the military cemetery at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. soldier whose lineage dates back to the OSS of World War II and who performed valiantly in Vietnam is a unique individual. Definitely type A personalities. Aggressive, um, knows what he wants, knowledgeable, always strives for perfection. Uh, I think that's the type of person that, uh, that gets there. If, if you're not aggressive, if, you, if you're there just merely to meet the standards, not to exceed them, you're not going to make it through the training. You're not going to enjoy what you need to go through once you've made it through the training and you get into one of the operational groups. Normally, uh, I believe an individual that uh, wants to prove something to himself, one that he can fulfill in the training phase, that's the first challenge. They have been called the world's finest military teachers. But in order to wear the distinguished green beret, each soldier must first become an astute pupil. The men who volunteer for special forces are already soldiers in the U.S. Army. They have completed the Army's basic training, and some have even specialized further in the military. However, to earn the special forces tab, the conventional soldier must complete grueling training, training that is difficult by design. Now, going through special forces training and uh, being part of this organization probably uh, has had more significant impact on my life as a learning tool and as a life experience than anything else I can relate to that I've gone through. Uh, the, the training matures the individual. You're taught an awful lot, but still you have to have something down with inside you to pull out uh, to continue. It's, it's real easy to stop and quit and say enough is enough. Not doing that is what makes the grade, what makes the difference. The first step for the volunteers is to survive the assessment and selection process held at Fort Bragg. This 21-day course is the initial step in a journey that not everyone can complete. Only those soldiers who successfully complete this process will continue on and train to become a Special Forces team member by going through the Qualification Course, or Q Course. We're just trying to evaluate their complete makeup. You know, the guy needs to be physically fit, he needs to be intelligent, he needs to be motivated, committed, a team player, um, ability to uh, communicate effectively. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty encompassing um, assessment that we do, and we're looking for a guy who's truly committed and has all those attributes. You know, he's going to get to a team and, and be an effective. He's going to be value added. There's a series of um, runs, ruck marches, obstacle course, there's uh, swimming, there's you know, physical fitness exams. And it's, uh, you're placed in a stressful environment and you're with, there with uh, another group of guys all with that same common goal, same common goal of uh, one day being a member of a special forces team. One of the more challenging elements of assessment and selection is the obstacle course, also known as Nasty Nick. Everybody loves that, that day of training or that event because it encompasses probably every physical um, task that you can think of as far as being prepared. The average age of a soldier in the U.S. Army is 22. The average age of the Special Forces soldier is 31. But whatever his age, the physical prowess of a Special Forces soldier 
will always be tested at the standards of a younger man. It starts out, um, you're running, you're, you're hurling several different um, poles along the way, series of rope climbs, um, aircraft ladder going up to 30, 40 feet and descending down the other side, a series of tunnels um, where you climb in, you climb out. Um, if you have any fear of uh, you know, creatures or the darkness, I'm sure it will show there. A series of uh, monkey bars kind of replicates a jungle gym in some of the kids' backyard, kind of you know going from one rung to the next. A series of obstacles where you have to, you know, basically conquer the fear of heights. This whole time you're running, you're moving from event to event, so it challenges your, you know, not only your physical strength but your stamina and endurance at the same time. And it kind of culminates with a series of, once again, a series of monkey bars, a little bit of a water, then a low crawl to final cargo net and then about a two to 300 meter run to the finish. The assessment and selection course isn't even the beginning of training for a prospective SF soldier. Completing this portion allows you to be considered for further training. Many who complete the assessment and selection process are not necessarily asked to continue to phase one of the Q course. Once accepted, the real work begins. Green Beret training encompasses many skills from weapons and munitions training to learning different languages. And since 1982, officers and enlisted personnel train together. Phase one is the bringing entry level soldiers, not entry level to the army, but entry level to special forces into the Q course. That's where we learn, uh, we teach them an extensive land navigation course, which is probably the best in the world. Um, we go into small unit tactics, which is basic patrolling, to where each person, when they leave there, should be able to run a platoon, an infantry platoon. And not only on the aspect of being able to do it as an ODA member, but be able to train uh, a host nation if we were to be uh, overseas. The toughest part of the Special Forces training for me was the, the field work. Because I had come from a strategic MOS, we didn't deploy, didn't go to the field, and it was a culture shock. Before coming to the Q course, my land navigation was basically from my workbench to the coffee pot. And now I had to go out at night by myself and navigate through you know, unknown terrain. Phase two continues the training, dividing up the soldiers into their individual military occupational specialties, or MOSs, where they receive specialized training according to their interests and abilities. Got it. Depending on their specialization, the soldier will spend between 24 and 42 weeks in this phase of training. The Special Forces MOSs are Weapons Sergeant 18 Bravo, Engineer Sergeant, 18 Charlie. Medical Sergeant, 18 Delta. Communication Sergeant, 18 Echo. Special Forces Warrant Officer, 180 Alpha. And Special Forces Officer, 18 Alpha. The longest and most intensive program is for the SF Medic. After he successfully completes this course, he will be a qualified 18 Delta. It's very long, it's very in-depth, uh, there's a lot of sciences involved, a lot of hands-on tasks. I mean, you can be very, very good uh, didactically and get great scores on your tests, but if you fail to be able to apply that with your hands on, say, a trauma test, you, f you fail twice and you're gone. I'm the crew chief, the medic on the airplane. I brought this guy, it was about 45 minutes ago, we had 15 minutes of flight you got time. A, you have a field medical was, card on him? Nah, man, it blew away with the yeah, helicopter. He was conscious on the plane, okay. and then all of a sudden he went unconscious, so I had to tube him. Okay. He's been complaining about uh, his left arm and his uh, right leg here. Okay. And I, I noticed it started, like, bleeding and everything. All right, Hodge, go ahead, take C-spine control, come up. Hey, go ahead and put direct pressure on that right there. Got it. Come up. Hey, buddy, you with me? You responding? There's no response. Go ahead and no check response. the airway quick. We're going to go ahead and make sure that tube's in place where it's supposed to be. Medics in training are subjected to scenarios where the environment and patients accurately present the brutality of injuries found on the battlefield. The uh, scenarios are thought out well in advance. 
they, as I say, deal primarily with multi-system trauma. In other words, a person isn't just uh, coming in with a broken ankle. They're coming in with always some type of gunshot wound for the loss of blood because if we can treat the most severe things, then it follows that we can take care of the least severe things. It's been a while since we've checked our patient. Hey, buddy, you with me? Check for any response. Okay, it's been, got three more minutes for the blood, the bag, we're back, Hodge, I want that bag changed out. Okay. The medic's training goes beyond the obvious. Uh, but we get extensive training in dental work, uh, dental maintenance, extractions, veterinary medicine, uh, uh, exceptional trauma training, some of the best around. Uh, and anybody who is familiar with the SF Medic program, if you mention that, particularly doctors or uh, anybody in the medical field, They'll have the utmost respect for the training that we do get. Still have the airway maintained, the breathing, the chest compromise is being maintained with the right. pleurovac. So that's a very um, demanding job with a lot of responsibility, um, which is part of that honor of, of being an SF medic. The weapons sergeant, or 18 Bravos, specialize in the use and operation of all U.S. and foreign weapons. This mastery of arms means knowing weapons from the past and present and preparing themselves for the cutting edge weaponry of tomorrow. Special Forces soldiers are trained to operate and maintain numerous weapons throughout the world because globally they can be called to go anywhere. Our 18 Bravos are incredibly up to date and proficient in doing that. The engineer sergeants, or 18 Charlies, must be experts in both construction and destruction. They must possess adept engineering and field fortification skills, including the ability to construct buildings and bridges. But at the same time, it is his job to employ explosives to destroy targets or conduct sabotage. Three, two, one. Execute. Okay, the silhouette charge did exactly what it was supposed to, all right? This is a solid core door. It was a three-wrap charge. It punched the hole right through it clean. The communication sergeants, or 18 Echoes, have the responsibility of knowing every detail of the installation and operation of all Special Forces communications equipment. They must specialize in high-frequency and burst communication equipment, antenna theory, and radio wave propagation. All of the MOSs will be put to the test when they are expected to act as a fully functional team during an unconventional warfare training scenario at the end of the final phase of the Q course. Initiate. The Special Forces soldier wasn't recruited and he wasn't trained because of his physical prowess, although that's, that's a, a part of that. But the Special Forces community is made up of some of the most intelligent individuals that you'll, that you'll ever encounter. It's not about how many push-ups you can do. It's about what you use upstairs. That's what changes the, the environments and the cultures and the societies in which we work in. In the Phase 3 Committee, they teach uh, the unconventional warfare part of the Special Forces Qualification Board. They start out, you go out there, they learn about air operations, how to set up drop zones, how to infiltrate by air, via either a helicopter or a airborne platform as a C-130 to get into a denied area. How to uh, plan missions, 
for their unconventional warfare exercise. Uh, from there, they also learn cross-culture communications. And then they start the isolation phase. Phase three rounds out the Special Forces soldiers' training, culminating in an extensive unconventional warfare training exercise called Robin Sage. All the MOSs come together, all the military occupation specialties come together, the medics, the engineers, communicators, the officers. They work as a detachment and see if they can do these skills in a simulated combat environment. Once a soldier completes all three phases of the Special Forces Qualification Course, he is awarded his Special Forces Tab and his Green Beret. I got to tell you, it, nothing ever felt better than getting that beret. Um, it was, uh, you know, I, I mean, it was just a symbol of excellence. I felt like I was joining the finest military unit since the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, I knew that my training was just beginning. Uh, I knew there was going to be a lot more challenges that would face me. I had gotten the braid because I had walked across the st stage and uh, completed a course, but I knew there was a lot more to it, uh, a lot more that I would have to do to earn it than uh, just, you know, from a school. The completion of the Q course is far from the end of training for the Special Forces soldier. Once assigned to a group, he is then appointed to a 12-man operational detachment, Alpha, or better known, as an A-team. The soldier must gain specific knowledge that will help him better support his team in a foreign country. Each A-team has an area of the world in which it works. Now having become a full-fledged member of the Special Forces, the soldier must be educated in regional specific training. The Special Forces groups are assigned missions in various geographical areas of the world. That can vary from jungle training to mountaineering uh, to urban environments, desert environments, uh, tropical environments. An example, 10th group uh, primarily works in Europe. They need to be aware of cold weather training. They need to have cold weather gear. They have to be proficient in skiing, cross country, uh, downhill, you know, alpine and Nordic skiing. You look at people from 5th group who are a lot of times working in Africa. Uh, they have a lot more motorized vehicles to get around. Uh, the Humvee is used a lot, and so various other vehicles that they use. So they need to be proficient in maintenance for that. One of the main skills the Green Beret soldier learns is how to achieve access to his targets. As a result, they are proficiently trained in the use of different types of charges and explosives. An important part of the training that SF soldiers receive is close quarter combat and the Special Forces Advanced Urban Combat Course. The face of war has changed over the past three decades, shifting from jungle warfare to conflicts in the urban centers of the world. The Special Forces soldiers are equipped with the skills necessary to succeed in this type of warfare. Most people associate armed forces with running around in battlefields. Most people don't associate a battlefield with being a downtown in a large city. Give me some guard. We teach our students that come through the Special Force Advanced Urban Combat course a variety of charges. These charges will help them get into the target. Now, whether it is a direct action mission to where they're going into a target for a certain uh, item or, or recovery of, a, of, of personnel, or whether it is just to get off the streets and, and to find cover. Urban combat is a very dangerous, uh, very dangerous game, or a very dangerous war to be fought. And uh, if you don't keep training in it, it's, a, it's definitely a perishable skill. It's something that requires a lot of training. Uh, you have to keep an open mind. There's a there's so many variables when you're fighting in an urban combat situation. Um, so many things you have to look at. General Boykin uh, realized that we, somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of uh, the world's population uh, currently lives in urban areas. So it only stands to reason that uh, future conflicts might, might parallel that number. So in order to be, to be prepared uh, to meet the, the enemy on the probable future battlefield, we, we need to know how to do close quarters battle in urban environments. 
Because the majority of Green Beret missions are conducted on foreign soil, language training is imperative to the success of their operations. The communication skills are critical. Um, for example, if, you're, if you have to teach uh, a certain subject in a foreign language um, through an interpreter, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. You have to get your point across so people understand that because these people depend on the training that you're giving them. They depend on that with their lives uh, in, in some instances. So it's, it's, it's very important. I tell my students, not only do you have to do your job efficiently in this language, imagine doing it in another country with an austere environment it's hot, it's, it's freezing cold, and you have to do it in another language. The Special Forces soldier may elect to extend his area of expertise by completing an advanced course. Among these are Military Freefall School, the Combat Diver Course, Water Infiltration Course, Special Operations Target Interdiction Course, and the Operational and Intelligence Course. The Special Forces Underwater Operations School in the Florida Keys trains Special Forces members tactical scuba and how to infiltrate a hostile environment undetected. The thing that a dive team, dive ODA, brings to the table that a lot of other units don't is just another capabilities of infiltration. And that's what diving is. It is a method we use to get to work. We do the same missions that, that any other SF team does, except for we can do it. Uh, by going in underwater. The Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape course, better known as SEER, was developed by Nick Rowe, the famed Vietnam-era prisoner of war. Held captive for five years, he gained insight which would help train future Special Forces soldiers. Because of his experience of being a POW and being one of the only Americans ever to escape out of uh, the POW camp, he decided that people needed more training in how to deal with being a prisoner of war if they were captured, or how to res resist interrogation, and how to just survive. In 1989, Colonel Nick Rowe was working as a military advisor in the Philippines. Though it was decades later, his communist foes from Vietnam still held a grudge, and they took the opportunity to gain their revenge on the streets of Manila. When he went to the Philippines, there was a, still a group, a very strong communist group there, and they just swore to get him, and we knew he was gonna be, he knew it too, that they were gonna try to get assassinated, but he, he uh, just, they got him. The whole purpose of this charge here is to place over entire locking mechanisms. It'll blow out every locking mechanism. So if you've got deadbolt, deadbolt, key and, and deadbolt, this will pretty much cover the entire locking mechanism. On one, you blow the charge, boom, execute, execute, execute. That time the door will blow open, you toss your shield, you don't want to carry it out with you because that's just going to be in a way, right? You toss it, you go on in. Make sense? Let's go hot. Cross-training within a special forces group is vital. Today's A-teams consist of 12 men, a number that was developed through trial and error in the 1950s. Vietnam proved that as force multipliers, 12-man teams could be split into two teams of six, or further to six teams of two. And those two U.S. soldiers might have the responsibility of several hundred men. Along with the specific training for the individual MOSs, the soldiers continue honing their skills in land navigation, small unit tactics, air operations, and mission planning. These skills are the essentials that all special forces operators must master in order to thrive in an ever-changing environment. With the experience of three major conflicts behind them, the SF soldier continues to evolve in an ever-changing environment.
being an SF guy, um, the, the history that Special Forces has uh, is not a long history if you look through the history of the military of the United States. But uh, Special Forces has done so much in the last, say, 50 years uh, to shape what the military is doing today that uh, that history is very important. And uh, just from the initiation of uh, special operations, when we track our heritage back to the uh, OSS and World War II, all the way up through Korea and Vietnam and, and on, it's been a lot of uh, participation by special forces in all the conflicts the United States has done since then. Following Vietnam, the special forces units were cut back with the rest of the military. Vietnam was one of the watershed events for Special Forces. You also had the post-Vietnam drawdown where we lost a lot of that Vietnam era experience. I mean, there's still very few guys around who have that experience. Though nearly half the groups were deactivated, the remaining SF units continued their leadership roles and began nation-building training at home in the United States. During the decade of the 70s, the U.S. military began a move back toward conventional warfare. But the core of the SF soldier remained intact. Unconventional warfare, direct action, special reconnaissance, and foreign internal defense. In other words, they were still the ultimate Renaissance soldier. And in the next decade, America would need to call on those skills more than ever. You had another real watershed right around the Reagan administration when we got rebuilt up because we got downsized so much in the 70s that during the big rebuild, we had to take a lot of that focus and reach back and, and rob that information from those who had went before us. In the 80s, the first and third special forces groups were reactivated in response to the instability abroad. The seventh group was operating in El Salvador to train Salvadoran troops in their struggle against communist guerrillas. While stationed in Panama, 7th Group found themselves at the flashpoint of Operation Just Cause in 1989. With the 7th Special Forces Group, we went down there and we did our job. What I'm most proud of of Panama is most people that, most of the uh, Panamanian Defense Force personnel that we apprehended, we talked them out of fighting. Most of us spoke Spanish pretty well or fluently. We've lived in Panama for many years, so we could basically go to house to house, talk to people out of fighting, and give up. Their knowledge of the terrain and their ability to speak the language allowed special forces to operate effectively in Panama despite the political and military chaos of the Noriega regime. Once Noriega was captured, the Green Berets went back to work, retraining the new Panamanian troops. Panama, we were still down there after it's all over with. So maintaining rapport with even your enemy at times is important, because when it's all over with, you still have to build them back up to make them uh, a legitimate government and a legitimate police force. One of the biggest things going right now is foreign internal defense in which they'll go forth these other countries at their request as part of military aid and uh, and training around the world. The deployments is just, for special forces worldwide, is just unreal. Uh, somewhere the average of 270 days a year being gone. In 1990, the SF began their key role in Desert Shield. They went in early to train local forces, including the Kuwaiti and Saudi Arabian resistances. Once the conventional troops were deployed, SF units went deep behind enemy lines gathering much needed intelligence on enemy activities. In the words of General Schwarzkopf, they became the eyes and ears of our conventional units. The things that they did for him, uh, it just uh, just amazed him, you know, going so deep in enemy territory, uh, identifying targets, identifying the Scud missiles and setting up lasers on targets and all that for the Air Force. Uh, it just it amazed him. Uh, a bunch of guys can do something like that, you know, and. Uh, and nobody ever complained. I mean, the guys just go ahead and did the job, and that was, that's, what, that's what SF is all about, you know, the guys that go out and do it.
think Special Forces has headed to being the lead um, element in most of any actions that the United States would be um, asked to, to participate in. Um, we're in the advisory role. Uh, we're in helping humanitarian type uh, assistance. We're in counter measures, so to speak. The Special Forces are now under the control of the U.S. Special Operations Command, or SOCOM, joining the other elite forces such as the Air Force Special Operations, Army Special Operations Aviation, U.S. Army Rangers, and the Navy SEALs. The Special Forces played an integral role in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom and in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. In 2001, the Green Berets and the Navy SEALs led the fighting in Afghanistan by sweeping through the rugged terrain and searching out Taliban forces. While still playing a key role in Afghanistan, in 2003, the Green Berets were once again called to action in Iraq. On March 18th, two days before the official attack, the Army's special forces were sent into Iraq to seek out Scud missiles and pinpoint bombing targets. This was the largest integration of special operations and conventional forces in any war in American history. Today, thousands of Green Berets remain in Afghanistan and Iraq in a nation-building role. They help train the newly formed Afghan militia and Iraqi army and have the challenging task of helping to rid these countries of remaining security threats. Special Forces, uh, having begun in 1952, has gone through an evolution process uh, from four basic missions, uh, special reconnaissance, direct action, unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, to more global missions uh, to include humanitarian assistance, counter drug operations, to name a few. But the, the environment in which Special Forces operate in, as is the world in this day and age, is constantly changing. They have become our nation's finest ambassadors, and as the global community evolves, their role is only becoming more vital. The Special Forces has a unique position in today's Army, and that is I, with the localized uh, warfare in the world, the Special Forces is uh, uniquely suited to fight the local skirmishes going on around the world, the small-scale, high-intensity skirmishes that are all around the, the, the globe at this time. Uh, Special Forces is going to be the army of the future. In this day and age, we're looking at things such as space-based platform deployments for our Special Forces teams. Uh, the day of getting on a C-130 aircraft may become obsolete in the near future. We may be launching our teams from the space shuttle. For the Department of Defense. Maneuver complete, placing discovery. The type guy that joined Special Forces today was the one who would walk beside Daniel Boone 250 years ago. We have gone to Texas with uh, Crockett. A fellow once told me, a guy I respect a lot, that SF's the type that they knew what was going to happen at the Alamo would have gone. Of course, the Mike Force would have stopped. One of the common myths about Special Forces is the uh, Hollywood portrayal of of a character named Rambo. 
And that Rambo character was created some 20 years ago. And it still kind of follows us around. Uh, there's no such individual. Killing people is not what Special Forces is all about. This commando crap you hear about. We can do it. I know some people make the Rambo in a movie look like a punk. That's for real. Y'all can do it, but it's not, you know, that's not what it's all about. We help people build schools, organize them, organize their government. Not only building schools, build churches, teach them how to cultivate the land. It's not a group of steely-eyed killers just looking for an opportunity to draw blood. It's a group of committed um, romantics who go to strange and different places and teach people how to survive better or help them defeat a foe that has them oppressed. To liberate the oppressed, that's what it's all about. I think there can be a case made for the fact that conflict is, is more the norm in human nature and that uh, the peace is the exception. And uh, whether, you know, whether that's out of just pure competition or whether it's out of uh, what, what we see in the world today with all the, all the, the, the fractures and the, you know, the lines of stress and, and uh, uh, all the fault lines that exist out there, uh, I think those are going to be with us as long as there's human nature. So my view is the Special Forces not only are relevant today, but uh, is going to be gaining in relevance uh, astronomically as we move into the future. They are a breed apart, a highly skilled, finely tuned soldier. Their sensitive and often classified activities typically go unreported to the general public. They are the quiet professionals, the elite of the United States Army, and the finest class of soldier in the world. They are the Green Berets.